access some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. Ooh, excuse me. I had hamburger helper for dinner, and I didn't mean for that to come back up. What a professional show we have here. Uh, my name is Chris Spangle. You're listening to We Are Libertarians. Hopefully you continue after this embarrassment of a beginning. Uh, but I promise it may get better after here. So uh, stay tuned. We're going to talk about the articles of impeachment introduced today. Uh, we'll find out if it's a joke, if it's serious. Um, Reinhold is with me. Harry is off tonight due to a sick child. So he begs your forgiveness. So in just one moment, we will return. Warning. This show is for adults, produced by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. Good evening, everyone. Uh, maybe eight time when you're listening to this. Who knows? That's the beauty of podcasts. You could be listening to this like six years later. Uh, it really is incredible how many people go back and listen to 10-year-old shows in our feed. Um, this is episode like 378, or I have no idea what it is, but it's, it's in the 300s. And we have like 667 items in the feed because we have such a huge library of content. So make sure you scroll back. Maybe you'll find something in there that you like. But uh, thank you for joining us here on this episode. My uh, uh, my my buddy Harry is uh, not here tonight. Harry has a sick child, as I mentioned. Uh, no, I did not lose another co-host. I, I, I wanted to ask, how's niece doing? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fortunately, uh, man, I was going to volunteer tomorrow night. Uh, there's a new women's shelter that just opened up here and to help kind of raise some publicity for it. Uh, I was working with some media types there at the work at the work at the day job. And um, I wasn't the one like really pushing it out there. I was just kind of helping arrange some vo volunteers for it. Uh, and. You know, so I just I was like, I'm gonna go to the libertarians first because we're all about private charity, right? That's the foundation of society. I post to the group, hey, I'm looking for a few volunteers to go help serve food to uh, some homeless women. And uh, niece comments, I'll be there. Does anybody want to bang? <laughs> and uh, I'm not bringing Narcan. So he's really a derelict of a human being. Um, if you if you've never heard James niece, it is he literally has 4chan on his license plate because he's one of the original members of 4chan. So, and he's one of our uh, contributors here to the program. So go back and check out some of his conversations about uh, stuff. I didn't think we'd start with a niece intro, but uh, Reinhold is here and Reinhold uh, obviously hates everything Trump and is a socialist. Um, so we'll go back and forth a little bit tonight about the articles of impeachment. Um, not really sure where I'm at, so we're going to kind of go through the details. We'll see if Reinhold can persuade me, and I'm going to challenge his uh, firmly held beliefs. Often wrong, never in doubt. That is Reinhold. Uh, inaccurate statement? Oh, I don't know about that. All right. Inaccurate probably, but not the, uh, for, you know, I can be swayed. I just have to be swayed with, with valid, good arguments, not being called uh, a, a liberal commie every time I say something. <laughs> That's not in the wheelhouse of some of the people who I uh, engage with, right? So Yeah, if you're a patron, then you get an extra – I think we did an extra 25 minutes. Well, so you did an extra 25. I did a, <laughs> I did a whole much. rant on the Mises Caucus. I'm going to be honest. Oh, it was funny. Um, it's good, too. You want to hear it. Not the whole Mises Caucus. Uh, <laughs> just Joshua Smith, mainly. Uh, I find him to be a demagogue and unfit to be chair, but we don't talk libertarian politics. Uh, so if you want to hear that rant, then you need to be a, a Patreon member. But, uh, uh, I, I, what I hate is jihadism and within every political movement or religious movement or ideological movement at all, there's always jihadists and, uh, you know, the, 
the person that le- reads Lou Rockwell unironically <laughs> in the libertarian movement for a long time has kind of been the uh, the jihadist of our movement. It's, it's gone on forever. There's a great uh, thing written by John Hospers, the first libertarian candidate, I believe the first openly LGBT candidate ever to run for office. He, he wasn't open. Oh, he wasn't. Well, he, he was. He wasn't closed. He did. He didn't deny it, but he wasn't open about well, it. Well, he's out now. Uh, <laughs> well, it's a few years later. It's okay. <laughs> he's uh, gone on to uh, to heaven, to presidential candidate heaven. And he's running around with other presidential with TR, I guess. Uh, and Tony Nathan, the first woman to ever receive an electoral vote. Uh, and so he wrote this article called "The uh, Anarchist Temperament," I believe it's called, and. The libertarian versus anarchist temperament. And it just shows you like the first generation of libertarian party people were were dealing with that same kind of mentality. And what my rant on the Patreon is basically I just don't like if somebody is telling you that to be a real libertarian you have to hate or like the right people. And if let's say you only read Mises, you're good, and you read Reason magazine, you're bad. That person that is telling you that or the person that is trying to encourage you to think that way. They're the problem, uh, and you're a real libertarian if you use your brain to find out what you believe and then uh, focus on that. And uh, one of the things that we like to fight here is extremism uh, and jihadism in the libertarian mindset. Uh, and I'm sure there are people out there going, why would uh, we have Reinhold on so often when clearly he's not a real libertarian? That's because he's irritating to people like you. And sometimes me, uh, and I like to I like to pick fights with them. But we have Trisha Stewart. She has a show on the network, Gingerarchy. She's a proud member of the Mises Caucus. Um, she and I talk about this stuff all the time. You know, we have anarchists like Harry. We have uh, conservatarians like Brian Nichols. We have the full range here on We Are Libertarians because we want to foster ideological diversity. So. Uh, if you're a patron, then you can hear that bonus. Uh, we, every show we do an extra 15 to 20 minutes that you can hear before the show. And we've got some special bonus shows that we're going to be doing soon. want to thank uh, a, a special shout-out to Jeff Bennett. Uh, he just re-upped as a $100 a month subscriber to our Patreon. Uh, as uh, you know, these great contributors every month who go above and beyond. We have so many great patrons, uh, and I thank each and every one of you who donate. Um, but especially the $100 a month, that's a big chunk of money uh, to give towards the growth of this network. And we want to thank Jeff for re-upping, Jason Doolittle, uh, Craig DaCosta, Ed Brehob, and Matthew Durbin. Uh, Matthew Durbin, a great supporter of all the hundreds of shows that I'm on, and I appreciate that. But we want to give a special shout-out to the lovely Christy Avery, who got braces today. Um, in her late 20s, she got braces And we'll probably, I think, I don't know if she was joking. She's going to have them on for like the next decade. Uh, But it sucks having braces, man. I had them for eight years as a kid, and it just is the worst. So uh, big ups to, as the kids say, to Christy Avery. Uh, I began last show with a plea to many of you saying, listen, here's where my head is at around this show. And I want to hear from you. And, uh, you know, Fallen.Freedom on Instagram gave me a shout out. Believe it or not, Reinhold. Uh, he told me that we calm him down. <laughs> you know, we help him make sense of the world. And I go, if you listen to me and Reinhold and especially Harry, and that, and if you listen to Harry and that makes you feel more hopeful for the world, you got problems, bro. Um, but it takes all varieties, I guess. Well, I mean. Even with our criticisms and the way we uh, see society, we are still, I think, a little more open-handed and hopeful in that. I mean, at the end of the conversation, I think we try to come to a point where we're not ready to go slash our wrists as we get off the podcast. No, not yet. No, we can, we'll get there one of these days. I mean, That'll I was, be the... <laughs> if you listen to 2014, 2015, <laughs> yeah, but not anymore. I'm doing great. Um so I want to. So several of you wrote in, and we'll read. I want to start reading some letters. So if you uh, if you want to write in, editor at wearelibertarians.com, send us a note, or you can go to the website, wearelibertarians.com, and you can uh, send us a note that way, or hit it me up in the DMs. But I want to hear from people who listen to the show, 
what do you like about the show? Uh, if you have questions, if you have questions about a topic, um, if you, um, you know, we're not looking for like topic suggestions, you know, hey, I'd love for you to talk about that. I'd, I want it in question form. Like I've been really thinking about this thing and it's really tough. And can you give me some clarity on X? Uh, that stuff would be great. But, you know, I was just saying in the last episode that um, I was considering closing down the show at the end of the year, kind of had lost my mojo a little bit. And uh, I really want to have a two-way communication with this audience. And uh, I appreciate everybody who wrote in and several of you wrote very, very sweet notes. And sometimes I don't get the chance to write back uh, the very meaningful response that you so richly deserve and in the moment can only write a thank you. But I want you to know that I read everyone, I share it with the team, and we really do appreciate it. And I wanted to read this from Patrick Hill um, because he's kind of touching on something that is going to be a Patreon thing uh, very soon. Hello, Chris and the rest of all. I just listened to the latest episode on the podcast, the Medicare Part 2. I just wanted to reach out and let you know how much I enjoy the show and give my insight into a few things. I've been listening to the podcast for a bit over a year at this point and have even gone back and listened to some of the older podcasts. While is one of my top three political podcasts, I listen to Jason Stapleton's Wealth, Power, and Influence and Dan Carlin's Common Sense, and uh, he mentions Hardcore History, which is the current show. I look forward to uh, – my fucking cat is in the way. Can you get out of here? God. So that doesn't happen on Hardcore History or Jason Stapleton. They're way more professional than this piece of shit show. Uh, I look forward to listening to your show with so much enthusiasm. I have even shared some of Hody's debates with some friends as a prompt for our own debates. I hope you never stop the show. My day is instantly made better when I see a new show from Wall pop up on my podcast app, and I cannot wait until I have time to listen to the show. If you do end up doing the show for the next 70 years, know that I will be listening in a nursing home. Now, Chris, you mentioned something at the beginning of the most recent show about how you feel as though you are starting to do what Dan Carlin does, and that got me thinking. I love hardcore history and loved common sense. I do not know if you would be willing to take on such a massive undertaking, but a podcast that was on the scale of hardcore history but focusing on political topics would be something I and many of my friends would absolutely listen to. Two to four shows of that scale per year would be all that I think anyone would be able to do, but I would look forward to such a show with the same zeal as I wait for hardcore history. Uh, I completely understand that this idea is too large a project for you, and I, you seem like a very busy individual, and the amount of time a show like this would require would be a big investment. But I just wanted to put the idea out there and let you know that some of us would definitely listen to such a show. One last thing. Do you know when Hody will be back? A few of his shows were, if I am being honest, what got me listening to the rest of Wall. I really enjoy listening to him and his ideas, even if they are a bit on the fringe sometimes. Well, he's Mormon. It's the magic underpants. It does something to his brain. He can't help it. Uh, if he is not well, emotionally or physically, let him know he should take the time he needs to recover. And I, as well as many other listeners, I'm sure I'm eager to hear him on the show once again. Here's the truth about Hody. Thank you for taking the time to read this message, Patrick. Uh, Hody had a, a horrible incident um, shortly before, and, and it's why it took so it's taken so long for him to come back. As you know, he's Mormon. He lives in Utah. This is going to be tough, and maybe this isn't my news to share, Reinhold. But Hody went to dinner one night and had a coke. And has just not been the same since. He went off the bandwagon, led to ca it led to coffee, and he's just been – his little heart's been erasing ever since. So, no, Hody is perfectly fine. Hody and uh, Trish had an issue with their computer, and I have been bugging the hell out of Hody to get his computer fixed. He's too embarrassed to ask for donations of either a computer or – uh, money to fix this computer, but it's been like six months, and it's taken too long to get this thing. He's getting the blue screen of death, and I told him that if he doesn't get it done soon and start producing shows, then I'm going to go on this program and raise money for him because everyone loves Hody, and uh, turned out such a great uh, set of shows through 2019, and we're so thankful that Hody's still involved. He will be back, and if you want to send him a computer, uh, just send it... Uh, care of the Mormon Church in Utah, Salt Lake City. I think he works at a restaurant there, so maybe call uh, one of those, and maybe you can send it there. So 
Uh, no, but in seriousness, uh, we love Hody, and uh, that is the truth. Hody has computer issues, and we'll be back, and we'll be uh, doing shows or else. Uh, I've made it very clear to Hody that he is beloved, and his absence will no longer be tolerated, and we're aggressive lovers here on the on the on the show, Reinhold. We don't take absence lightly. Uh, we take it as a personal <laughs> attack. Well, and. And part of the problem, too, is, is he can't do the video. That's where the system starts crashing when he tries to video um, his stuff. So he doesn't want to do just audio. We don't want him doing just audio because he's got that face. It's just the gorgeous. We need him on to, to counterbalance me, basically, because um, we don't want to scare everybody away with, with what I look like. So we need to get Hody on to kind of balance. Hody's a beautiful man, and you, sir, you're handsome. I was in my youth, maybe. <laughs> 30 years ago, we could have a chat with that. So. Uh, one of the things that I am planning is something along more of the Dan Carlin lines. I'm not going to give a ton of details here. I will be giving more details to, to the Patreon. Um, but I, I'm kind of sketching out the outline of a very long-term project that I want to do that kind of uh, traces back the ideological origins of uh, what what libertarians believe, Democrats, Republicans, like what are the kind of the, the beliefs that we have now? Where did those come from? What are the origins? You'd be amazed if you kind of read near history. If you go back and read something like The Greatest Comeback by Patrick Buchanan about Nixon's uh, rise to the presidency after having his ass kicked in 1960. You read a book like that and you go, wow, okay, that's where that thought, that talking point that we are obsessed with now, you see the origins of it when you go back and read kind of near history. And so I think if people had a greater understanding of the history of their thinking, then they might examine things a little bit differently as opposed to just kind of grabbing onto cliches and running with it. Um, and so what I would do, because it's such a long project, I would actually do kind of a like a, a podcast notebook for the, the research that I would do for our patrons. And then um, I would do a podcast about the building of the content. So like a podcast about podcasting type stuff for our patrons as well. So some of that stuff is coming. If you've ever wanted to know, how did I build this? I, I do podcasting for a living. Um, so I'm going to do a podcast about podcasting. Uh, basically, as a shameless ploy for money. Uh, because I have uh, 15 years of skills that I can monetize and get asked constantly. And I'm just tired of typing the same email over and over and over. And so I'm going to put it into uh, something that I can sell you. And uh, I, I think wall fans would, would find that interesting too. So uh, stay tuned for that. I'm not going to give any more details here just because uh, I want to do it kind of between me and my pals and the Patreon to get some feedback from folks but not something so public and, and eventually kind of turn that into uh, a, a serious project that is not, th th that's a little more public. So I appreciate the encouragement to do that because that's actually what's been on my mind, Patrick. And so, because one of the things is that um, Wall is here to help you kind of figure out what you think and what you believe about the world and then translate that to your friends and try to help you understand what the hell is going on? So, Dennis, what the hell's going on? Uh, <laughs> we were we were kind of working on an impeachment update and uh, working with our great researcher, Sam Schultz. And then about like 10 o'clock, he sends a link and says, hey, they introduced articles of impeachment. And I'm like, great. Got to do the show over now. And uh, <laughs> nice of them to nice of them to do it on a, on a show day. So at least we could go through it a little bit. Um, were you surprised or was this kind of the articles of impeachment that Nancy Pelosi and others, uh, Jerry Nadler specifically introduced today? Was this a surprise or am I just way out of the loop? Nope. This is not a surprise. This okay. is, um, they have indicated since the beginning that they wanted this process to be done by the end of the year. Uh, they want to move forward on it. That's why they're not fighting the, um, the subpoenas that they put out there are being ignored and, and um, not, well, not just ignored, but um, angrily uh, shouted down by the, the administration. Subpoenas um, to whom? 
subpoenas to several members of the executive branch, uh, like Mulvaney and, and John Bolton and one of John Bolton's aides, uh, anybody in the executive branch. They, they've subpoenaed documents. None of the documents are being um, provided. So um, the administration is saying we're not responding and participating in any way with this sham impeachment. Yeah, that's the problem is like saying you're not going to mount any kind of defense whatsoever and then calling it a sham process. It's like still a process that's taking place, like calling this a fake impeachment. No, it's a real impeachment, bro. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, he's, it, it's not like he's not going to be impeached. <laughs> he is going to be impeached. So You're going to have a trial. Like it's a foregone <laughs> conclusion at this yep. point. Like why wouldn't you want to defend yourself? Like is he just – it, it, are people like what's the general consensus is it that his, his strategy of ignoring it is that he's gonna just win public opinion on it or yeah. is he just in case that's how you that's how you won president is by being uh against the establishment and fighting all this bull and with saying the real stuff you know all all that you know propaganda and demagoguery that he participates in it's just part of that right you know he keeps saying that i've not done anything wrong i there was a perfect call and anybody who read it can say, no, it wasn't. It's obvious what you were doing. Um, but it doesn't matter to him. He's just, he's just going to – it's not like he's never lied, right? He's, right? he's always just saying whatever he thinks needs to be said to make himself look good. Right. And that's why he's a populist. That's what they do, right? So, um, for so he's got a base of people who are all in on that. So when he goes out and says this is a sham impeachment, he's got 30 to 40 percent of the people in the country who go, it is a sham impeachment. You're right. And just don't even listen to anything that's being said, because now it's a sham. Now it's fake news. Now it's the Lugan press, as it were. Um, What is it? Godwin's law has already been invoked. (laughs) I did not. I did not say anything about Hitler. Okay. (laughs) I just Uh mentioned that there are propaganda um, methods that are taking place that are being used. We've and right. we've seen them before. It's not just in Germany that that happened. So, but uh, as irritating as Matt Gates can be, the congressman who's kind of <coughs> been the main pro-Trump person in, in the spotlight in in Congress in these hearings, as irritating and and as clearly phony as he is, you know, he's he's like Adam Schiff levels of phony. He's had a few points where I've gone, okay, I could see your argument. So why wouldn't you want to participate in it and make the same argument? I I guess it it has anybody from the Trump world explained why he's actually not doing this. Only that he doesn't feel like he has to, because this is all a witch hunt. That's the only defense that has ever been given. Um, I think a lot of people would like for him to just, because he says that if I just went and testified, I, this could all be over instantly. And I'm like, well, why aren't you doing that? If you want this over with, right. you said the same thing. Well, see, here's the problem. He said the same thing about the Mueller investigation that he, um, he had nothing. He didn't do anything wrong. Therefore, uh, I'll let you talk to whoever you want to talk to. And, um, it came back and bit him. Right. So he's going the other track now saying, I'm not letting you talk to anybody. You know, the heck with you. You're not going to try and find some weasel thing that happened by somebody else and then make me look like I've done something wrong. That's what's going on in his head. Now, he knows he did what is being accused of being done, but he doesn't think that that's anything wrong. And that's kind of part of the problem. Right. All right. Well, good luck with that strategy. <laughs> I just, I mean, I guess he doesn't really have to participate. Well, it's, there, the, it's working. <laughs> You know, well, there isn't so like when you studied the Clinton impeachment, for instance, one of so they put up four articles of impeachment and only two, mm-hmm. two proceeded. One got voted down mm-hmm. as was a perjury charge, the other was an abuse of power charge, mm-hmm. uh, of one, which is one of two, two that Trump is charged with. And uh, the it went to the Senate, and the Senate has the has a rule that once the trial starts, that a senator can file basically to dismiss all the charges, and then a simple majority vote can clear them, uh, can just wipe the whole thing off the docket. And it was like six months before a Democrat senator finally filed the motion in the Clinton impeachment 
to dismiss the charges, and it failed. It continued on. I feel like this is such a – this is a scandal to be sure, but this is not such a slam dunk case, not in the way that you – I don't agree with you if you believe that. Um, but there isn't any doubt in my mind that they're going to go to the Senate and a Rand Paul or John Kerry or whatever the guy's name from Louisiana is – or Lindsey Graham, they're gonna they're gonna file that motion within the first week, and it'll it'll be gone. It'll be done. Like this is a foregone conclusion that they're going to within the next week go to the House floor, pass the articles of impeachment on a partisan borderline vote, which has not happened in the other four or the other three impeachments. Is it? Yeah, it's three, right? Clinton, Nixon, Andrew Johnson. Uh, Nixon never had the articles of impeachment voted on. Right. So the inquiry was was done, and the inquiry lasted for a little while. Yeah. Right. Which is he was gonna he was going to it was going to pass, so he resigned. Um, right. But the the reality here is that this is going to be a partisan vote in the House, which it hasn't been the other three times. It's going to be a partisan vote in the Senate, which it hasn't been the other three times. Uh, doesn't that concern you that this is sort of all hat, no cattle. No, it concerns me that that's the type of environment that we are in right now. It doesn't matter. None of this matters because Trump has enough senators in his pocket that it's, he's never going to be removed. So he doesn't see any reason to participate. What's the point? Why give the ammunition to make himself look bad to the Democrats, not – to Congress, which is supposed to be Congress is supposed to be, you know, in a tug of war with executive branch on the control of power. Right. That's the whole way it was built. Now it's just the White House and Republicans against the Democrats in this in the House. And that's it. It's it's pure partisan politics uh, and partially on both sides. I mean, I, I don't think that all of the Democrats are altruistic in their uh, view. I think they were looking for something to hang their hat on and when it popped up and and was there right well but that's it was al green says day one we're going to find our he files impeachment on uh, charges on racism like well they did the same thing to clinton they did the same thing to obama they did the same thing to bush this has been the last four days huh you use that argument but let's not pretend that any articles of impeachment filed against obama or george bush had any significance they were, they were but there was, but there were no articles. There were no articles filed against Trump until just this last, just to that yesterday. Because it was a coordinated effort, waiting for the right moment <laughs> to file them. You don't think Benghazi, eight years, six years of Benghazi uh, hearings, wasn't a coordinated effort? Secret behind door uh, meetings for okay. against You're Obama. Right. I mean, it's 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 the way the politics is being played the last couple decades. Every every, I think it's. So Clinton got into office and they immediately started investigating sure. and uh, and they wanted to find that travel gate happened within a, through a, a week, two Whitewater, weeks in whitewater basically carried in with him. I mean, you can go and listen, yeah, yeah. get an episode that I'll put in the show notes on the history of impeachment. Mm-hmm. I mean, Clinton was a uniquely corrupt individual, Hillary Clinton mm-hmm. as well. Like, so of course they were looking for stuff and that's, that's the same with Donald Trump. He's a uniquely corrupt individual. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you listen to our impeachment episode, you'll see the parallels between Bill Clinton and, and Donald Trump and, and the establishment basically looking for reasons to get this guy out of office. And that's what's gone on with Donald Trump. We'll get to the IG's report next week. But there, there's just been a coordinated, it, it, maybe not even totally coordinated. I, 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 w- I will fight you on House Democrats have consistently spent, spent a lot of their time trying to figure out when is the right time to impeach this guy. Well, yeah, I, I'm not saying they haven't, but that's kind of their job. Is it? it? Not necessarily to look for impeachment day, you know, but to say we're supposed to be looking at the executive branch to make sure that they're not doing anything wrong. That's their job to do. That's what the con- the Constitution set for them to do. And I think you, that you that's a good thing. That you can't argue to me constitutionalism when there's nothing constitutional about the the current Congress and its complete lapdoggedness of the, the administration, be it Republican or Democrat. Like you can't, you can't cry a foul of the constitution one minute and then continually do continuing resolutions 
as a, in the budgetary process. Oh, like, well, the, another great example of that is when um, in the report, Schiff put in those phone records, and now we have Nunez and, and, the, and Rand Paul and all these people complaining about how you know, they're spying on us. Really? Why are they able to do that? Maybe it's because you guys voted in the power to do that and you're getting hit by your own thing now. I don't feel sorry for you about it. I don't feel sorry about any of these people for what happens to them. The, the, the issue of what happened uh, with Donald Trump, what he did, uh, is, is, a, is, in my opinion, a slam dunk, but it doesn't matter. Nobody hears it. Nobody cares about it. I mean, the evidence is clear what happened. So I don't, it, nobody's even talking about the evidence anymore. They're talking about uh, all this other uh, stuff that um, they're just throwing up to try to get their side to be, to come out on top after the struggle happens. And we're the ones paying the price for it. I look at this and go, it's, it's, it, it's not clear. Like, okay. It, it's like you and I argued over Lou Rockwell. Did he, or did he not write? the racist Ron Paul newsletters. You can't find any source out there. Like if you Google did Rockwell write these newsletters, you're going to, it's all going to be traced back to Dave Weigel's article in Washington post or some mirror site of that. And it's Dave Weigel basically presenting circumstantial evidence. Basically many people are saying that he wrote these, you know, it, it, it doesn't show you that he, actually wrote the newsletters now just because a so, lot of people a lot of people say that he may have there's no direct evidence that he did and it's the same thing with donald trump in the ukraine he was very smart in insulating himself from there being real proof of what he was doing that he was the one that was ordering it there's a couple layers to get to and so i go back to your subpoena argument if we really want to know what happened and we really care about the facts, and we really care about the truth, then why wouldn't they go spend the next few months fighting in court, ending up probably in the Supreme Court, forcing Rudy Giuliani and Mick Mulvaney and John Bolton and Pompeo, forcing them to testify? Why, if this isn't completely a partisan effort to diminish Donald Trump's efforts in 2020 to get reelected, as they claim he, he's trying to cheat, which we'll deal with that in a moment. You know, they're trying to use their congressional authority to pers to basically tar and feather uh, Donald Trump with an impeachment charge and a trial at the beginning of the year. They're rushing the process. This is going to be the first impeachment hearing where we really don't have direct intent, direct evidence. You had on tape Bill Clinton lying. You had the blue dress. You had Nixon on tapes. You had Nixon erasing tapes. You had witnesses saying directly, he said to me in a meeting to erase the tapes. You know, the Andrew Johnson impeachment was basically entrapment by the Congress, and he said, yeah, well, fuck you, and did it anyways. I mean, if, if they really are trying to get to the bottom and protect the Constitution, why wouldn't they go through the court process to try and get these people to testify, force the executive branch to testify. Otherwise it just looks completely blatant because there isn't a direct line of intent here. There, but if, ah, if we had gone, so, no, this, no, listen, I, I, want, I want to explain something here okay. and how this works a little bit. Uh, so if, if the whistleblower had come out and, and the report had come out and they started inquiries and they did the inquiries and they talked to all the people they talked to, and laid out all of the information with Sondland and, and uh, Fiona Hill and Taylor and all these people and, and, and uh, Vin, you know, if they had done all that, right. And laid out this whole thing. And then people are still kind of like, well, it's, you know, it's compelling evidence, but it's not, it's just, there's nothing there. And then the transcript of the call got released, not by Trump, but by somebody else that had got a hold of it. And the guy that released, that would have been a smoking gun. That would have been what you're talking about wanting as a smoking gun. But because Donald Trump pushed it out at the beginning of it and said that was a perfect call, then now everybody's going, well, maybe it is a perfect call. I don't, I don't know agree. if that's true. I, I, don't, I don't think that that is a convicting piece of evidence at all. How is it not convicting when he says uh, we want our aid and, he's, and he responds with, well, you need you – know, 
I have a favor for you. That's that's how mob bosses do it. They don't say, and okay, don't let's let's lay this out, and I'm going. It's the same thing. No, they get the, caught. It's the same thing as the Comey conversation. You know, I'd really like you to do this. It was ne it never rose to the level of obstruction of justice that's, because of the way that he worded it. Because that's how he does. That's how if you had this in a court of law, he would be convicted. There is no doubt. I, I don't. That's how they got people agree. Gotti. Um, okay. They got Gotti on tax evasion. Well, I, mean, I know, but I'm just saying that they get those people though. On when when you try to like, if you were if if you were you, right, and you're not a president, and you tried any of the stuff that he he has done, where he has tried to obstruct, if you tried to bribe a jury, you know, a juror, and the juror said, "Nah, I'm not taking your bribe," you still go to jail, whether you did the initial thing or not, right? So. People are are saying, well, he, you know, they didn't get the they they got the aid anyway. Well, that doesn't matter. It's the intent. It's the it's the attempt to bribe. It's the attempt to extort. It's it's not whether it worked or not. And the only reason it didn't work is it how, was working. How do, you, it, how do you know Donald Trump's intent? Because even if you read the call, even if okay. you read the, the hold on, because the the argument that he intended to to cheat in the 2020 election as they're now alleging it's gone from a quid pro quo to bribery to now he's cheating it didn't go from anything it's the same thing it, quid it, pro quo is just the when i go when you go to mcdonald's and you order a hamburger that's a quid pro quo right so the the, the phrase quid pro quo is not the crime the crazy phrase quid pro quo is the method of proving the bribery or how the extortion you, how do you prove though which you you can, I, I've got it. I'm yes, you can. First of all, first no. First of all, I can give you the proof right here. Two let ways. Finish, let, can I? Okay. I will mute you. This right. week, um, how can you prove that Donald Trump wasn't just acting on bad information from an overzealous, excited Rudy Giuliani? Now, it isn't an intent to cheat in the election or bribe bad partners. If he if he is acting on just bad information. Because he's he's got a, a lieutenant who is being suckered by pro-Putin forces in the Ukraine, telling them what they want to hear, and he's making a bad decision on bad information, and he's leveraging the power of the United States to actually get an investigation into something that was pretty corrupt. I mean, it's not looking good for Hunter Biden when he's taking fifty thousand dollars a month and his dad's vice president. Whether whether he is. Whether Donald Trump is believing conspiracy theories and acting on them, it really does matter. Because if Donald Trump is just an idiot acting on bad information, that doesn't show intent. If he goes, I don't care what the truth is, I'm intending to beat up Joe Biden and force him out of the primaries because he's my strongest opponent, well, that's intent. Okay, but it's not the same if he's just acting on bad information. It gets into very dangerous territory where you take a president and start impeaching presidents for just acting on bad information and assigning intent to it where there isn't. So the chain of intent has not necessarily been uh, ratified in my mind. Okay. So uh, a few things. First of all, uh, Nick Mulvaney admitted to it. Second of all, he did it live on the news where he said he wanted Ukraine to investigate the Bidens and, and China to investigate the Bidens, not to go after corruption in a general sort of way or whatever. He wanted the Bidens. The other thing I can show you is that in the discussions on the, so there was a clear intent that for a white house meeting to happen, an announcement had to be made. There was crafting of that going back and forth. We have the documents of those emails that show what the um, announcement was supposed to be. It was sent. Rudy Giuliani says this is not good enough. Uh, it needs to be changed. And the only change that was made to that statement was investigate the Bidens and or investigate Burisma in the 2016 elections. Okay, so Rudy Giuliani acted inappropriately. Right. How does that affect the president? Because the president said he hasn't. The president said he's done a great job and is doing what he wants. Okay. And 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 really Giuliani says he's been doing what the president wants him to do. So 
if you are going to say that you're doing what the president wants to do and the president says you're doing what he wants you to do and all this comes out and he doesn't say anything about it, that has to kind of lead to proof of that. Now, here's where I will give a point in your favor on this, because Donald Trump was only interested in corruption in the Ukraine because uh, he was only interested in Joe Biden's corruption. Right. He, was, he wasn't interested well, in and he, he wasn't interested. Corruption. And then the other thing, he wasn't inter- interested in the corruption. He was interested in the announcement of the investigation of the corruption. Right. right. He honest. didn't care. Yeah. The, you, you have when that, that detail matters. But, but there's no way to get around it. You can't you can't. You, you know, if you try to pull in Giuliani, he comes in and says the fifth, you don't get no proof. I guess he gets away with it. You have to be able to have circumstantial evidence come to a conclusion at some point. All of the things line up to that being the intent. He's not in the call. He says the perfect call happened. He says it was about corruption. The word corruption doesn't show up one time. He says Burisma. He says Biden's. That's what he cared about. And there's only one reason why he would care about just that as opposed to general corruption that's going on. And all of that come from conspiracy stuff and the whole thing we can get into later at some other point. But um, just the fact that that's even part of his mindset is kind of scary too, because that's in the, in the last episode on impeachment. Right. But, let, but let's say that he did have intent and he did do this. And this is everything that you say it is. <clears throat> it didn't work. And so the argument that he was trying – that he was – he was hold on. He was cheating in the 2020 election, which is actually what Jerry Nadler said on uh, mm-hmm. one of these Sunday shows. And you have uh, Adam Schiff basically saying uh, – I don't, I don't have it in front of me, but basically their argument is he cheated in 2020. Or he cheat, he's trying to cheat. They're basically saying he cheated with Russia in 2016, which is verifiably false at this point thanks to millions of dollars of federal investigations. And he's trying to cheat in 2020. We can't allow him to cheat. They're essentially setting the stage for if he wins again uh, to basically claim that this was a sham election. And we know that if Donald Trump loses, he'll claim it's a sham election. This is going to be the – you know how every election – It's the most have, important like, election ever in history. Yeah. We have – on inauguration day, this is what makes the American system so special. It's a bloodless transition where everyone respects the process. This is going to be the first election in history where one side doesn't respect the process. I thought the most dangerous thing that Donald Trump says, go read The Storm Before the Storm by Mike Duncan about the fall of the Roman Empire or the fall of the Roman Republic to the empire. Uh, and you see the uh, Gracchi brothers and how they eroded the Mus Maiorium. Uh, and uh, eventually killed the single these single individuals who I'll call uh, Gracchi Trump and Gracchi Trump Jr. Uh, <laughs> wrote in the the uh, basic tenets of the republic. Um, and I, I was just shook to the core when in a debate Donald Trump said he t- really wouldn't accept the outcome of the election. And it was horrifying. And Hillary Clinton was horrified and released all these – and that's exactly what Hillary Clinton did. Hillary Clinton lost mm-hmm. the election and never let it go. Blame social oh, media. Yeah. Uh, and they're setting the stage to do that again if he wins again. And so I have very little sympathy for Democrats who but, wax on poetically about our democracy under a threat when they have basically been attacking our democracy the entire time. And it was only a matter of time before they actually succeeded. You use the mob boss Gotti example. Well, they were after they were after Gotti. They were after uh, him on a con- on si- co- consistent basis. They were, he was always under attack. Uh, William Barr, the attorney general, said it's an unprecedented amount of lawfare, essentially, where they are uh, basically attacking the executive branch. They being state uh, attorney generals, Congress. Um, the entire legal structure is essentially trying to eat away at the executive power. Not mad about it, but it is, um, I think, an important point. And so let's say Donald Trump, uh, do, do you have any sympathy? Let me ask this question first. Do you have any sympathy for Donald Trump in terms of the amount of attacks that he has withstood? I mean, does it? And I've made this point to you many times. 
people probably care a lot more about this if they hadn't been trying to impeach the guy since January 21st, 2017. So first of all, to go back to your first point, and I'll answer that. The, the first point, the last point you were trying to make where this didn't work, where do you get that this didn't work? It worked immensely in his favor. Everybody's now believing that Biden was over there making million, billions of dollars on the side. Hunter right? Biden was making No, no, no. Joe. Yeah, that's what he got paid. That's why he wasn't the only one on that board. We had the former uh, uh, prime minister of Poland was also on that board and, and wrote glowing things about the great work that, my, that Hunter did. Do we think that he was on the take too? How many, how many of these people were on the take? Well, how big is this comparison going? I mean, we, in order for him to be doing anything remotely illegal over there would have taken, you know, to, to say that, that Joe Biden had Shokin fired because he was investigating um, Burisma, which he wasn't doing. He was actively not doing. That was part of why he was trying to be fired. But to say that that was the reason behind it, Joe Biden had to convince the IMF, the UK, the EU, Republicans in the, in the Senate, all who were calling for him to be fired because he was blocking investigations into the owner of Burisma, not into necessarily Burisma. Burisma wasn't the target. It was the owner of Burisma and all of his other companies were all being investigated. People thought um, Biden were worried about Hunter Biden taking this at the time. There were, the it looks. Yes, it looks, it looks kind of bad. It's nepotism. It's, it's like, yeah, that really doesn't look good. And, in politics, how, and how can Trump say anything about that with what he's got his kids doing? It's okay, not any different. Right, well, it's kind of hip it. hypocritical. My, my point is no, it's hypocritical. Is that the new administration of the Ukraine didn't release the press release? It this all only came out, Reinhold, because the press is trying to find reasons that Donald Trump is a corrupt individual. Right, like, but they were going to. They were. They, you can't say that this that this oh, that, that look it worked. It it did work because everybody's talking about how corrupt Joe Biden is. Mm -hmm. They're talking about how corrupt Joe Biden is because Donald Trump is defending himself from the whistleblower leaking this because this whistleblower, which is very clearly a partisan who had access to the president, uh, leaked information about this. This is, it's not like Donald Trump he, led with this. No, but he had. What I'm saying is he had. Uh, he had Zelensky ready to go on air. They had an appointment uh, interview scheduled for CNN to go on air and give this um, statement. The whistleblower, start. yeah, the whistleblower came out. He canceled that appointment and never did the announcement. He was going to do the announcement because he wanted the aid. Also, the aid got released after the whistleblower thing came out. So just because they got caught doing it, and we and it was stopped doing it. Now we have the information that it happened. If we had never had any of that whistleblower stuff happen, then Zelensky would come out, made his announcement, and it would have thrown things, you know, at Biden. So he gets to win either way. That's how he operates. He gets to win. It doesn't matter, right? He's a terrible cheater mm -hmm. if he's cheating. And honestly. Uh, one comment about this if it had leaked like that's where I, I it falls flat with the whole uh, cheating argument which the subtext is basically if he gets elected then we're not going to believe it and we're going to diminish the, the duly elected president for a second time in a row no I, I don't agree with that though I mean I, I don't um, if he wins the election he wins the election Right. Yeah, I know you. I want the information. I want the information out there. I want people to see what he's done. And we talk about all the other things that he's being investigated about. He's doing those things. He's antagonizing those people, and he, he's putting himself in the position to be investigated on all this stuff because he's pushing the bounds of his his office, which every president has done, and he's just doing even more of it because he's doing it open and blatantly. So people are pushing back, and so I don't feel sorry for him for it. If he wanted, if if he wanted to come in here and do a good job and and be squeaky clean in doing it, great. They wouldn't have been found. They wouldn't be able to find anything. They wouldn't be able to, uh, you know. So so yeah, they started investigating him the day they came in because they knew he was going to do something. Did they catch him? And he did. He gave them exactly what they wanted. 
he didn't have, that's the, that's the funniest part about all of this is that that call took place the day after the Mueller report came out, which stated if he had asked for um, Ukraine to, to, or asked for a Russia to release information about his political opponent, that would have been um, actionable as a crime. The next day he actually does that exact same, that exact thing. And, and everybody talks about, you know, it's it was an abuse of power to even ask um, Ukraine to you know get involved in in this at all. Then on top of that was the pressure to do it. The the things were holding against them, but just the ask itself was bad. There's uh, an agreement that we have with Ukraine on fighting corruption that you go through, and it has to. It's a treaty that we have. So he was violating the treaty by having his personal lawyer going and trying to dig all this stuff up, talking to all these assets that were um, the the anti reformers uh, that had been kicked out of office by the Ukrainian people, and trying to get their take on things. Have Joe but, Biden's numbers changed at all because of these revelations? They've gone down a little bit. He's still in the front row. He still no no actually in the new polling that's come out I was just listening to uh, the the newest um, state polling and everything else uh, Buttigieg is rising fast and uh, I think Sanders is leading in Nevada Buttigieg's leading in Iowa and it's either Biden or Buttigieg like tied almost in New Mayor Hampshire Pete, Mayor Pete will never last he's the flavor of the month yeah. So the, the reality is that Hillary Clinton is floating the idea, and it's not a crazy idea, that she's the only one with the infrastructure other than Bernie Sanders to actually run a race that is competitive. Maybe Joe Biden, if he gets any infrastructure from the Obamas. Well, but, Hillary's proven that her infrastructure is not good enough. Because uh, she couldn't. her because she's insane. Right. No, I'm just saying that she's, she proves that she can't – if she had just gone out on a few – actual campaign swings i think she would have won the thing yeah i mean she just had to show some get up and go and do something she just sat back and did nothing and expected this to fall on her lap and i don't feel sorry for her one bit for losing okay so let me read this from rich lowry's column today an election too important to be left to voters he is the uh editor-in-chief the william f buckley successor at the national review and a very prominent co uh, defender of Donald Trump against impeachment. And he writes, where the Democrats have gotten tangled up is trying to find a justification that supports the enormous weight of impeaching and removing a president for the first time in our history. They've cycled through arguments. First, Trump's offense was said to be a quid pro quo, a phase, phrase cast aside for supposedly being too Latin for the public to understand. Then it was bribery which has lost ground lately, presumably because of the impl inherent implausibility of the charge. Now the emphasis is on Trump's invitation to the Ukrainians to, quote, meddle and, quote, interfere in our elections. This is posited to be an ongoing threat. Nancy Pelosi said in her statement calling on the House to draft articles of impeachment, quote, our democracy is what is at stake. The president leaves us no choice but to act because he is trying to corrupt once again the election for his own benefit. The president, once again, for his own benefit. Okay, the problem is Donald Trump didn't work with the Russians the first time, you crazy people. You can, it, the conspiracy mongering about Trump and Russia and interference, and like they're doing it in Britain. I just saw Boris Johnson. The only reason that he's gaining in the polls is because the Russians are uh, spamming people online. And like nobody ever sees any of these fucking ads and believes it. It's such a conspiracy theory. Our democracy is what is at stake. The president leaves us no choice but to act because he is trying to corrupt, once again, the election for his own benefit. The president has engaged in abuse of power, undermining our national security and jeopardizing the integrity of our elections. House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jerry Nadler said on the Meet the Press last weekend that Trump has to be impeached for, quote, for posing the considerable risk that he poses to the next election. Asked if he thinks the 2020 election will be on the up and up, he said, quote, I don't know. The president, based on his past performance, again, conspiracy mongering, will do everything he can to make it not a fair election. The gravamen of this case is that the election is too crucial 
to allow the incumbent president of the United States, who is leading in key battleground states and has some significant chance of winning, to run. In fact, the integrity of the election is so at risk that the United States Senate should keep the public from rendering judgment on Donald Trump's first term or deciding between him and, say, his nemesis of Joe Biden. Um, of course, it's possible to imagine a circumstance where a president would indeed pre present such a grave risk to our elections that he'd have to be removed. This is a reason that we have in the impeachment process in the first place. But what's the real harm that Trump's foolhardy Ukraine adventure posited? And he basically goes on to say, what effect did the Ukraine really have on Joe Biden and not much? So there's an election in less than a year. Why should Trump be impeached and removed from office if we have an impeachment process or, or if we have the ultimate remedy, the voters deciding? Why are the Democrats arguing that they should get to decide for us, Bennett or Reinhold? Well, first of all, they're not deciding anything other than Trump shouldn't be in office and the uh, vice president should now be president. That's it. That's all they're going to be deciding. They're not going to putting. They're not putting Nancy Pelosi in charge of the country. Yeah, but why are they were so outraged by Merrick Garland right. not getting a hearing and being put on the Supreme Court when there was an, when Mitch McConnell made the very reasonable argument that there's an election in a few months. Let's see what the voters decide. I don't think that was very reasonable, but um, here's the problem: you are asking people to. Um, say let the let the election decide whether he should win or not when it's him manipulating the election that he's being charged with right we've caught him on this thing if he's willing to do this and he was you know i, I and he was asking for china for helping him i mean i, I don't see where anybody would think he's not going to try it again you know or try yeah. to get away with it he did that in 2020 when he asked russia to look for the emails like he's a blow. 2016. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. It's the same thing. Uh, it's yeah. going to be Hillary versus Trump again, all over again. She's uh, right. But uh, see, he does that because it's propaganda stuff though. I mean, he, he's pushing that. And, and we're, what we're saying is he's using his, his, his power to help put himself in a better position to win. So like Maduro does and Saddam did, you know, they, they won landslide elections. They were sham elections, and I'm not saying that it would be a sham yeah, election. I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying that. This, uh, I'm not making that comparison exactly. What I'm saying is, though, that's the concern: is that what else is he capable of doing if we let him stay around? If he, because he he knows he can get away with it. He's got 30 guys in his pocket. He's got 30 senators who he's funneling money to for their reelection, who are sitting on the jury for whether he should be removed or not. And that's okay. I mean, it's legal. There's nothing in the Constitution that says that can't happen. It's unseemly to me, but that is what it is. We have a broken system, a broken process. I don't think. I argue that they're rushing the process because they want the 18 Senate seats that are up for this to be in play. They want Donald Trump to appear in every ad for their nominee saying, This president has been impeached. You can't vote for him. They're using their political power to influence the election. Like, it's yeah, but just so blatantly the, obvious. They, don't st they still get that if they wait two months. That's not what the problem is. That's not why they're rushing it. It's going to take more than two months for the courts to decide whether or not executive privilege applies. Like it's no, no, no. Well, I don't think so. I think, I think the Supreme Court's – no, the Supreme Court will jump in on a quick one. So they've, it's already gone through several levels of federal courts where the, the Congress won but it's not got to the Supreme court yet. And that's where Trump's like, well, once the Supreme court gets it, they're on my side, they'll vote for me. And the I don't Senate believe it. For, but the Senate trial for Clinton took more than six months. If I recall. No, it's like five weeks. I, I remember this process being a lot longer when I studied the from, and from beginning to end was longer, but the actual Senate trial, I think was six weeks. Okay. So, the, you know, I, I, what I, they're just, just trying the, the, if they just want to say that he is impeached, the Senate trial doesn't matter, right? They could have that in April. To. They all know that it's not going to. It's not going to matter. It's going to get kicked out because, all right, Gerald Ford once said, uh, while in Congress, an impeachable offense is whatever a majority of the House of Representatives considers it to be at a given moment in history. 
Mm -hmm. He's basically saying it's whatever political winds are blowing, but it could also be interpreted as like when I first read it, my, I don't think I interpreted it right, but I thought, okay, he agrees with me uh, is how I interpreted it because I look at it and I go, impeachment should be a very high standard because it's, it completely paralyzes the entire political system to debate this one thing if you're going to impeach a president, it should be incredibly obvious that this is impeachable. You had uh, – who were the senators in the Nixon impeachment? Sam Nunn and uh, the other guy. Uh, Baker, I think. Yeah, Baker. You had uh, Wardoff and Statler. Uh, <laughs> basically, these bipartisan senators who really forced it, get Barry Goldwater and a, and a group of senators. You had much more of, A, ideological diversity. Um in the older Senate because of ge different geographical makeups. But even in the Clinton impeachment, you had, uh, you had the abuse of power charge, for instance, chucked by the Newt Gingrich Congress. <laughs> you, you had a, a more serious look at this than this rushed partisan look. I just don't find this to be rising to the level. Like, I get look that he abused his power. I totally... <laughs> am with you that this is a constitutional issue, that mm -hmm. this is an inappropriate use of funds, but is this something that you're going to remove a president on or to attempt to move, remove a president on in a rushed manner several months before an election? It just doesn't make sense. It looks hyper-partisan as opposed to the way that the process is intended to work, which is a high crime and misdemeanor. Uh, this is This is... This is not terribly different than what a lot of presidents do in terms of abusing their power. You, Ben Shapiro consistently uses the argument of Barack Obama talking to Medved right before his election saying, uh, tell Putin I will have more flexibility after the election, so stop being so aggressive, and you'll get what you want after the election. That's him basically saying, hey, you're making it harder for uh, me to win my reelection, and I'm going to go easy on you. That's him doing the exact same thing. Presidents not use president power. That's not the exact same thing. That's exactly not the same thing. No, it's not. It, we're talking president, propaganda. President, no, president. That's not the charge. The charge is using. Yes, their, it is. The charge is using his official <sighs> constitutional duties to influence an election. To have a foreign power influence our election with propaganda. That's what that was. That's why he wanted the announcement on CNN done by the president of Ukraine and no fingers tied back to him. He didn't want it to look like he did. It's why he wanted to go on CNN and not Fox News. He wanted on CNN. He wanted Russia the announcement made there. Russia it's propaganda. Favorable, Russia creating favorable headlines in the United States by backing off gives Barack Obama a, a foreign policy win. It's the exact same thing. Presidents do this I, it's all not, the time. It's not propaganda. It's, it's They're trying to deal with a relationship. You, I, 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 see a, I see a big okay. difference. I, don't, I know is, you don't. I get I it. The point is you are – lowering the bar significantly and now you're opening this process up to the second a democrat gets elected in 2020 or 24 or 28 the republicans day one will start trying to impeach and they're going to do that anyway it, it's a right they did it with it, obama <laughs> they it is further an, an erosion it's instead of the Democrats that you, you want to sit you, and act like the Democrats are high and mighty and are some sort of uh, pillars of the constitution but I'm not saying that in any way. They are continuing to massively erode the process. Well, you, you find a lot of problems with Donald Trump. You, but you don't find a lot of problems with what the Democrats are doing. Uh, I do, too. I, I have no like for anything the Democrats are doing. I never have. I've got eight years of saying Obama should be impeached. You know, I don't know where that comes from that I'm defending the Democrats. I'm not defending anybody. I'm trying to defend the truth, and that's all I care about. Is the on is, is people agreeing to the facts? There are people who are saying that Trump didn't do any of this, and I'm like, I can I can have the argument and discussion um, whether or not he should be impeached for it. Rich Lowry, even who you just read from National Review, goes on L LRC every week and says, yeah, he did it, but I don't think it's impeachable. I can have that argument all day long. I can't have the argument. Well, he didn't do anything wrong. Yes, he did. And I want the Senate and the Congress to do their jobs and then keep the presidents honest when they're in office. And if that means impeaching every single one of them until they start getting the message that they can't do this stuff anymore, 
good. Well, so it sounds like a clear case of Trump derangement syndrome to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. But um, I know I'm just it's just it's maddening to me that okay, we went from we went from Clinton, who was doing some skeezy stuff and should have been impeached for other things than what he got impeached for. But he got impeached for what he got impeached for. Great, well, fine. He took the hit. Um Bush gets in, he should have been impeached. He wasn't. You know, he had he did a horrible thing with uh, going into Iraq on on bad information. Again, that's a policy thing. We say we shouldn't impeach for bad policy or bad information that he got from the from the you know the information that was presented to him about it. Um, but there's uh, other things that should have been looked at there. Uh, Obama, I mean, he was using the IRS to get his opponents um, damaged, you know, uh, and so. It, he was going completely against the constitution and using his war powers, which I think the Congress should have just hit him with hard the second it happened and they didn't do it. So they've let president after president after president get away with just doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And it's getting worse. And now we've got Trump in there who doesn't even care whether he's getting away with it or doing, he's just going to do whatever he wants to do and to heck with whatever the chips fall where they may. And Finally, somebody saying, "Hey, let's let's kind of roll this back a little bit." I'm all for that. I know it's political. I, it's supposed to be a political process. That's what this all was. The whether or not it succeeds or not is whether the representatives feel like that's what their constituents want them to go and represent for them to do, and that's what they're trying to judge and guess with right now. I mean, that's kind of the whole thing. This isn't like a, a court of law where we have criminal statues and everything else that we have to follow. This is an entirely political process and it always has been. And until the presidents start doing what they're supposed to be doing and not violating their oath of office, not violating their oath to the constitution to protect it, uh, we need to hit them every single time they do that. Every single time they break that oath, they should be hit hard. And then maybe one day one of the presidents will get it. Otherwise, we just admit that the the this whole republic thing doesn't work. We have a monarchy, a Hamiltonian what Hamiltonian wanted, and so be it. We just admit that and and get and quit trying to pretend that we don't. All right, you big dreamer. Um, let's actually go through the articles of impeachment that have been, and, and I'm actually going to read these for people. Uh, put the more boring part here at the end for you because I love you, listener. Um, let's actually read the resolution. Um, so Mr. Nadler submitted this. These will go to the House. Uh, that I think some panel has to approve these. We'll read the process next. Um, but these are what will be decided upon in the House. Uh, I need to turn off my feed, the the chats and everything are getting in my face resolved that donald j trump president of the united states is impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors and that the following articles of impeachment be exhibited to the united states senate those are the that is the identical language to the clinton and nixon impeachments uh trying to link those historically uh and gain some credibility um articles of impeachment exhibited by the house of representatives of the united states of america in the name of itself and of the people of the united states against donald j trump president of the united states of america in maintenance and support of its impeachment against him for high crimes and misdemeanors article one abuse of power the constitution provides that the house of representatives shall have the sole power of impeachment and that the president shall be removed from office on impeachment for or, and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. In his conduct of the office of the President of the United States and in violation of his constitutional oath, faithfully to execute the office of the President of the United States and to the best of his ability, which is not much, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States and in violation of its constitutional duty to take care of the laws be faithfully executed, Donald J. Trump has abused the powers of the presidency in that, using the powers of his high office, Trump solicited the interference of a foreign government, Ukraine, in the 2020 presidential election, 
He did so through a scheme or course of conduct that included soliciting the government of Ukraine to publicly announce investigations that would benefit his reelection, harm the election process, prospects of a political opponent, and influence the 2020 presidential election to his advantage. Trump also sought to pressure the government of Ukraine to take these steps by conditioning official United States government acts of significant value to Ukraine on its public announcement of the investigations. President Trump engaged in this scheme or course of conduct for corrupt purposes in pursuit of personal political benefit. In doing so, President Trump used the powers of the presidency in a manner that compromised the national security of the U.S., and undermines the integrity of the democratic process. He thus ignored and injured the interest of the nation. Trump engaged in this scheme or course of conduct through the following means. One, acting both and directly through his agents within and outside the United States government, corruptly solicited the government of Ukraine to publicly announce investigations into Joe Biden. A, dis a Joe Biden. B, a discredited theory promoted by Russia alleging that Ukraine, rather than Russia, interfered in the 2016 presidential election. And two, with the same corrupt motives, President Trump, acting both directly and through his agents uh, within and outside the government, conditioned two official acts on the public announcements that he had requested. A, the release of $391 million of U.S. taxpayer funds that Congress had appropriated on a bipartisan basis for the purpose of providing vital military and security assistance to Ukraine to oppose Russian aggression and which President Trump had ordered and suspended, and B, a head, a head of state meeting with the White House, which the President of Ukraine sought to demonstrate uh, its U.S. support for Ukraine in the face of Russian aggression. I'm trying to speed this up. Faced with the public revelation of its actions, Trump ultimately released the military and security assistance to Ukraine, but has persisted in openly and corruptly urging and soliciting Ukraine to undertake investigations for his personal political benefit. These actions were consistent with Trump's previous invitations of foreign interference in the U.S. election. Uh, in all of this, Trump abused his powers of the presidency by ignoring and injuring the national security and other vital national interests to obtain an improper personal political benefit. He has also betrayed the nation by abusing his high office to enlist a foreign power in corrupting the democratic elections. Wherefore, Trump, by such conduct, has demonstrated that he will remain a threat to national security in the Constitution as he if he is allowed to remain in office and has acted in a manner grossly incompatible with self-governance and the rule of law. President Trump thus warrants impeachment and trial removal from office and disqualification to hold and enjoy any honor, trust, or profit under the U.S. Article 2, obstruction of Congress. The Constitution provides that the House of Representatives shall have the sole power of impeachment and that the president shall be removed from office on impeachment for, uh, you know the drill, high crimes and misdemeanors, in his conduct and in violation of a constitutionally oath faithfully to execute the office of the president, and to the best of his ability to preserve the Constitution, uh, that the laws be faithfully executed, Trump has directed the unprecedented, categorical, and indiscriminate defiance of subpoenas issued by the House of Representatives pursuant to its sole power of impeachment. President Trump has abused the powers of the presidency in a manner offensive to and subversive of the Constitution in that the House has engaged in an impeachment inquiry focused on President Trump's corrupt solicitation of the government of Ukraine to interfere in the 2020 election. As part of this inquiry, the committees undertaking the investigation served subpoenas seeking documents and testimony deemed vital to the inquiry from various executive branch agencies, offices, current and former officials. In response, without lawful cause or excuse, Trump directed executive branch office agencies, offices, and officials not to comply with those subpoenas. Trump thus interposed the powers of the presidency against the lawful subpoena of the House of Representatives and assumed to himself functions and judgments necessary to the ex exercise of the sole power of impeachment by the House. Uh, Trump abused his powers 
of his high office through the following means. One, directing the House to defy a lawful subpoena by withholding the production of documents sought therein by the committees. Directing executive branch agencies and offices to defy lawful subpoenas and withhold the production of documents and records from the committees in response to which the Department of State Office and of Management and Budget, Department of Energy, and Department of Defense have refused to produce a single document or record, directing, directing current and former executive branch officials not to cooperate with the committees in response to which nine administration officials defied subpoenas for testimony, namely Mulvaney, uh, Robert Blair, John Eisenberg, Michael Ellis, Preston Wells Griffith, Russell T. Vought, Michael Duffy, Brian McCormick, and T. Ulrich Breckenbull. These actions were consistent with Trump's previous effort to undermine investigations into foreign interference in elections. Though these actions, President, through these actions, Trump sought to arrogate himself the right to determine the propriety, scope, and nature of an impeachment inquiry into his own conduct as well as the unilateral prerogative to deny any and all information in the House uh, in the exercise of its sole power of impeachment. In the history of the Republic, no president has ever ordered the complete defiance of an impeachment inquiry or sought to obstruct and impede so comprehensively the ability of the House to investigate them. This abuse of office served to cover up the president's own repeated misconduct and to seize and control the power of impeachment and thus to nullify a vital constitutional safeguard vested solely in the House. And all of this, Trump has acted in a manner contrary to his trust as president and subversive of constitutional government to the great prejudice of the cause of law and justice and to manifest the injury of the people of the United States. Wherefore, Trump, by such conduct, has demonstrated that he will remain a threat to the Constitution if allowed to remain in office and has acted in a manner grossly incompatible with self-governance and the rule of law. Trump thus warrants impeachment, trial, removal from office, disqualification to hold, enjoy, and honor uh, office of any honor, trust, or profit as the president. So those are the actual impeachment articles. Uh, only nine pages, repetitive, kind of saying the same thing uh, that we talked a lot about. Um, very broad. Some might say Reinhold too broad. They do not include obstruction of justice, specifically from the Mueller investigation, as many House progressives wanted. Um, but it seems that uh, the moderate, specifically the newer moderates from swing districts in the suburbs, uh, requested that that not be part of it because they didn't want to have to vote on it. So they have made this as broad and as palatable to the entirety of the Democratic uh, House members as possible so they can get through. Uh, and specifically in terms of abusing power for personal gain, uh, you can argue that every president in history has done something along those lines, Reinhold. I mean, I'm thinking of the – not. It's not what about ism, but just the one that might be fresh on people's minds is ordering the IRS to investigate your political opponents to help you win in 2012. Uh, that might be a personal benefit. Mm -hmm. Did you Definitely. And he should have been, he should have been impeached for that. And removed from office. Yeah. I wrote about that uh, back when it happened. It's, the the article is called the so-called scandal where he was trying to say it's a so-called scandal. I'm like, no, it's real. You're doing this. Uh, your, your your administration is doing this. We would have got. It, I would like to have got into to find out if he ordered it to be done or if it was just something that the IRS chief was doing on her own. Which I think she indicated that it was coming from higher up. But no, I, I think he should have. That's, that's a clear violation of what he should be doing as a president. I think our fundamental disagreement is that you are impeachment happy and I am not. I have a high standard for it and you have less of a high standard. You're well, like, I don't, I don't, I don't get a little bit more like the Joker when he lights the match and walks out of the, in the nursery. Before. <laughs> no, no, it's not, it's not that it's as libertarians, we've been complaining about the usurpation of power by the, by the um, executive branch for decades and decades. It's been going on for years and years, turning this into not so much a representative Republic, but more of a monarchy. And you, I don't understand how you can say um, we're against that, but then when 
presidents keep doing it, you're not calling for them to be held accountable for it because that's the only way it's ever going to stop is if people start. I mean, so Nixon did, got caught doing what he was doing, which I think was kind of less than what Trump did, but that's besides the point um, because I take into all, account all the other things that Trump's been doing. Um, and then Ford and Carter tried really hard to stay within the bounds. Carter was uh, – threatened with impeachment for not putting his farm in a blind trust. Right. So he wanted it, he wanted it in a blind trust, but he wanted his friend to run it. And the Republicans were saying, no, you can't do that. That's conflict of interest. You have, you know, a relationship with that person. Therefore that can't be a technically a blind trust. So he had to put it into an open trust. And that's when we found out about um, Billy Carter borrowing a bunch of money and having all these issues and everything else that came out from that. So now we've got the president not putting it into a blind trust and just saying his kids can run it and putting his kids in, in uh, charge of certain aspects of the administration, which is you will get no beyond the pale. Yeah, you will get no argument from yeah. me that he is uniquely corrupt and unfit but, to be president. Of the United right. States. But what I'm saying yeah. is, is that what I'm saying is that so we so they started actually trying to be good stewards of the Constitution and good stewards of that office. And even, you know, Reagan did that. And then. Then Bush got in, Bush Sr. got in, and, you know, and even Reagan, I think, it depends on how much he had control over Iran-Contra and all that stuff. But the the other ironic part is that all that stuff where we kind of started going off the rails in uh, presidential power again, um, the person who protected the president from getting um, thrown, basically thrown in jail over it was William Barr. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, how, how deliciously ironic is that, that us getting back into the situation where the presidents just keep pulling more and more power was William Barr protecting the president. Right. That's why uh, he was hired. Let's actually just give you a quick brief overview of what's going to happen next. So uh, this is an explainer from Reuters, how impeachment works and why Trump is unlikely to be removed. Uh, impeachment begins in the House, where debates and votes on whether to bring charges against the president via approval of an impeachment resolution or articles by a simple majority is uh, required. The Constitution gives House leaders wide latitude on deciding how to conduct the proceedings. Uh, so the House Intelligence Committee has conducted an investigation into whether Trump abused his power to pressure the Ukraine. Uh, they held closed doors, uh, testimony, and televised hearings before issuing a formal evidence report, which was l- released last week. Uh, the Judiciary Panel will use the report to consider formal changes that could form the basis of a full impeachment vote by the end of December. Here we are. Uh, if the House approves the articles of impeachment, a trial is held in the Senate. House members act as the prosecutors, the senators as jurors, the Chief Justice of the United States presides. Historically, the president has been allowed to have defense lawyers call witnesses and request documents. Now, can the Senate refuse to hold a trial? There is debate about whether the Constitution requires a Senate trial, but Senate rules in effect require one, and McConnell has publicly stated he will allow one to proceed. Republicans could seek to amend those rules, but such a move is politically risky and considered unlikely. Uh, The Senate rules allow members to file before the conclusion of the trial motions to dismiss the charges against the president. Such a motion passes by a simple majority. The impeachment proceedings effectively end. Clinton's Senate impeachment trial, which did not end in a conviction, lasted five weeks. Halfway through the proceedings, a Democratic senator introduced a motion to dismiss, which was voted down. Democrats control the House. The House comprises 431 members at present, 233 of whom are Democrats. Uh, They could impeach Trump with no Republican support. In 98, when Republicans had a House majority, the chamber voted largely along party lines to impeach Clinton, a Democrat. The Senate now has 53 Republicans, 45 Democrats, and two independents who usually vote with the Democrats. Conviction and removal of a president would require a two-thirds majority. The conviction seems unlikely. Should all 100 senators vote, at least 20 Republicans and all the Democrats and independents would have to vote against him. Uh, And then, obviously, Mike Pence becomes president. Should he be removed, um, the reality of getting 20 Republicans to defect 
is just not going to happen, especially when many of them are up in tough races around the country, uh, largely because of Donald Trump. Uh, so it, it's just not going to – the dog ain't going to hunt. Um, now, I did hear uh, Brian Lehrer, if you really want the daily nuts and bolts of this, WNYC has a good impeachment podcast that I enjoy listening to. The Brian Lehrer Show is where it's uh, lifted from, uh, which is usually pretty helpful in – it's an NPR show out of New York City. It's and it's the it's the best one of the impeachment podcasts. I've listened to a few. I, I think it's the best one. Yeah, it's he's he tries hard to be pretty down the line and has a lot of he's had Rich Lowry on and that's where I heard a lot of these counter arguments for the first time. Um the reality is uh the uh I had heard on that podcast, I remember I was going to say, sorry, I mean, it's, it's currently 9 p.m. here, and I've been up since 5.30, and have not stopped working since. I'm very tired. Um, I told Reinhold, I was like, listen, man, be prepared, because I'm going to be sleepy, but uh, I took some caffeine. It was all good. Um, I heard that Chief Justice uh, Roberts could th there's some option where the senate can say to roberts like you decide <laughs> and i couldn't imagine roberts actually taking that on that that would be so out of the realm of possibility for his yeah. personality <laughs> well after the after the obamacare ruling where he basically shivved the knife in the back of the yeah. that voted with obama for the implementation of obamacare i cannot imagine that he'd impeach a republican president he well, the, the reason the reason he did that too, though his his reasoning was he this is what the people voted for, so he didn't want to take that away from them. This is what the you know, so he's he's not wanting to step in and override the will of the people, as it were, uh, very much. So I, I don't see him deciding in in that favor, right? He's going to say, "Let it play out, and let you guys to figure it out." Yeah. So uh, that is kind of the process. Uh, so any final thoughts? Right, hold. Um, so my thing is that I, you know, I just want to make sure that people are not, I mean, if we look at the numbers, 70% of the people in the United States believe that Trump did what he's accused of doing. 65% yeah. of them think it's an impeachable offense or 60% of them. 47% of them think he should be impeached for it which is a little interesting to me is how you can get a larger number, like 12% difference between the people who say uh, it's an impeachable offense, but that he shouldn't be impeached for it. And I think that goes into the argument of, well, we're going to have an election in a year. So why are we bothering? Right. right. So I can, I can have that argument with people all day long and I will be happy to have it. And I can just disagree with people. Uh, it's just a, it's just a, a, you know, philosophical position in one way or the other. I think it's just an opinion of whether you think that this is something that he should be removed for. What I have a problem with are the people who are saying this didn't happen. That just blows my mind that we are at that point where it's just pure defense mode of, of protecting the cult of personality that is built up around this person. Right. Um, so I would, uh, when you see the, when you see the hearings and you've got the the completely dilatory um, actions of the Republicans and what they're doing to this whole thing. Uh, it was embarrassing. Uh, what the, a lot of the Democrats have been doing is embarrassing. It's just like, it, this is all, I mean, I would like for them to find more out, find the truth, talk to Bolton, talk to Parnas, talk to Giuliani, get them on the stand, talk and find out what happened with them. But at the end of the day, I don't think that's going to help it, what proof would people look for at this point? Like you're saying you, you want the, the smoking gun or the tape or something like that. I mean, they never really, I don't, I don't think there's anything that would change the numbers right now. So at this point it's, he's not going to get removed. Let's just get it over with and move on. Okay. All right. Uh, not insane. I will say that. I don't, <laughs> I, I see your points. I totally see where you're coming from and I don't, my problem is that I don't ever agree or disagree with people. Like I, my training is as a journalist. Like I went to high school for newspaper and then started like 
that's what I really wanted to do. So like, I look at, I look at things from so many different sides and I'm like, good point. And then I hear Rich Lowry. I'm like, that's a good point too. Uh, which is part of, I think why this show is so uh, different because I'm just like, you know what? He, Reinhold's right about that. And I'm like, you know what? Sebastian Gorka has a point of view that I had written. I'm just kidding. That never happened. <laughs> um, well, and if you like Rich Lowry though, he's on um, the left, right and center podcast. Which is, uh, yeah. Good which is a really good podcast, and then that they that host also does uh, all the president's lawyers with um, Kevin White, so Pope Hat. If you've uh, been on the Twitters, um, all so right, he's pretty good. pretty fun. All right, thanks everybody for listening to this show. We really do appreciate you listening, and uh, we uh, I may be back sooner than next Tuesday. I may Rob Cortell and I uh, try for weeks to set up an episode. Uh, we're, we shoot for like every two weeks and then it winds up like every six. Uh, he forgets or I have to cancel or whatever. But uh, so we may be back Saturday. Check that out. If not, we'll be back next week. Uh, tentatively, we were going to talk a little bit about the uh, the IG report into the FBI and some of the more juicy parts of the FISA court and get your little civil libertarian heart to pumping. So uh, tune in for that next week, and please join our Patreon, support our great work, and we will talk to you next week. Thanks so much for listening.